Hello and welcome to this Borns Incorporated presentation on the latest battery management system design solutions to enhance safety and extend battery life. My name is Kyle Moldenhauer. I'm a field applications engineer for Borns Power Conversion Market Segment and will be joined later uh, by Paul Smith who's also a field applications engineer but uh, belongs to the Circuit Protection Market Segment Group for Borns. Our agenda today is first give you a little bit of, of background of Borns the company and then move into actual battery management systems with an overview slide. From there I'll be taking over describing some of the particular magnetics design challenges uh, really for isolation in BMS systems and then move on to uh, metered solutions that we have for isolated power for low voltage uh, and then move into current sense resistors to give you an overview of that product offering. And at that point, Paul will be taking over, uh, giving us some effective over voltage and over current protection uh, solutions that we have for BMS systems. So Born's uh, vision is to be the company that our customers think of first for el reliable electronic solutions. To achieve this vision, we rely on outstanding service and response to our customers, whether it be through direct contact, through one of our long-standing rep companies, or through one of our distribution channels. Borns was established in 1947 uh, by co-founders Marlon and Rosemary Borns, and the company identifies with three major market segments, segments that you can see by the slide below, um, and they're designed to be uh, segments that we can allow ourselves to be an industry leader in component design and manufacturing. So this leads to innovative solutions in power conversion, circuit protection, uh, sensing applications, and with a long history of high quality product development and working intimately with our customers and IC house relationships, we seek to solve application and circuit issues along with setting industry standards across all of our product lines. So how do we accomplish this? Uh, it's through an arsenal of over 5,500 employees worldwide uh, in 11 offices, uh, 16 manufacturing sites for the different product lines, and in incorporation with 13 research and development centers spotted throughout the globe. I wanted to give you an overview of our, our product range from our catalog, even though the main focus to bit today is gonna be on power conversion. I just wanted to, to bring to note that there's many different forms of non-isolated inductors, high current products, and solutions for common mode and differential mode noise that we have available. Borns has a broad catalog offering that includes you know, a lot of series solutions with industry standard packages, but we're continually creating roadmaps for newer types of family series uh, and very much take into account you know, customer applications and opportunities that warrant any modifications of these family series are really is the springboard for coming up with uh, new roadmap solutions. Uh, however, for today's purposes uh, on a BMS uh, discussion, please take note of the upper left part of the slide, which features the, the transformer uh, components that we have or uh, will be having available on our website. So an overview of BMS systems. You can see by the slide uh, in green uh, really is, is to depict the, the power level requirements for the low voltage to high voltage side of a BMS system. And then the blue sections representing that same type but for uh, signal line translation. For either one of these two layers, uh, for component selection and overall assembly, there needs to be an isolation and safety barrier uh, incorporated somehow into this system. Uh, more often than not, or the focus of today's discussion and presentation, is to tell you about the product offerings that we have from a magnetics uh, and overcurrent protection solution to be able to solve these isolation and safety issues. So breaking down magnetics, uh, starting with design challenges, um, I've tried to note some key factors that I feel is for design success of a given design. And the first of which may be a little surprising to you. Right? Power conversion, I think of signal integrity based on waveform propagation, um, really in regards to the parasitics of the transformer. And that kind of leads to a springboard into 
being able to minimize you know size and, and losses and, and physical factors of the transformer while also meeting isolation and, and noise requirements um, in the whole design process and part of that starts with selection of topology and so I'll be covering that uh, in, the, in the last section before I go into solutions. So moving back to signal integrity um, I think of a, a pulse wave anatomy and what happens in a waveform even in a power application for transformer design. So you notice on the left part of the slide you'll see highlighted in green uh, leading edge attributes of the, the initial start of, of, a, of a period of a waveform. And the parasitics and, and activity of the transformer associated with that is things like the load resistance, the distributive or distributed parasitic capacitance, and also the parasitic leak, leakage inductance of the transformer. Um, the next thing is the top of pulse that you'll see in, in the middle section in light yellow. Um, those are attributes mainly for magnetizing inductance uh, with, with thinking about the transformer itself. Uh, and then the, the trailing edge or the, the, the decrease or the end of, of a period uh, is also things for concern of, of how to control parasitic distributed capacitance on the secondary side and then also discharge times of say the magnetizing inductance and total winding resistance. So in a nutshell, these, these parasitics for, for design get lumped into things, but you need to, to also consider the trade-offs for all these parasitics, because many of them involve uh, different uh, techniques that are opposing to each other. For example, interwinding capacitance, which is another transformer parasitic, is the capacitance buildup between the primary and the secondary windings uh, inside the, the coil and core assembly. Well, in order to lower inner winding capacitance, which it's desired to be low, you want to keep the uh, windings spread as far apart as possible inside the transformer. Versus leakage inductance, which is, which is opposing to that, again wanting to be as low as possible, except you want to try to couple the windings or put them as close together as possible internally to the coil and core assembly. So there again, you have this kind of balance between the two because lower uh, interwinding capacitance would imply improvements for EMC and, and EMI noise, uh, but lower leakage inductance would promote uh, leading edge transient ringing uh, on the input or the leading uh, edge of that waveform. So even taking those into account, um, those are just parasitics for the transformer that need to be considered. They don't address losses, core loss and coil loss, and, and other parameters even of the construction of the transformer to begin with. So that leads to how do we, we basically put this into a design to you know, minimize loss in size and not only address all these parasitics and, and trade-offs that I uh, addressed in the previous slide. So, um, magnetics design is an electromechanical process having to deal with several of these design variables at once really to optimize a, a, a solution. So is kind of is where the iterative process of transformer design has a nickname of, of being black magic. But I really think of, besides the design programs and, and, and information that's available, it's the experience and kind of the iterative measurement process that is part of transformer design that may give it that connotation. Um, all of them are important, uh, really, in the process of trying to design the transformer as quickly as possible. So, in addition to those things, um, so you've got you know loss, size, and parasitics. You kind of have to move to that mechanical side of things, where the physical factors of incorporating uh, safety into the transformer construction itself needs to be considered. So. Uh, an isolated conversion driver, this, the isolation requirements for this. What we're looking at is the galvanic isolation or the, the interaction of the user being separated from electric shock can happen anywhere. Uh, typically it is the transformer though that's, that's required to be able to handle or, or take care of this particular requirement per a standard. So to do that, we need to know a few things to be able to help with uh, design on our end. The first of which is what is the, the highest input or peak working voltage that the primary of the transformer will see. 
and then also incorporating are there any transients that we need to consider uh, to basically qualify it does it need to be designed for an over voltage category so that affects things of not only creepage and clearance but also you know high pod and other testing criteria that's within the standard so I just said clearance and, and creepage for as far as distance goes uh, those are two things that uh, constructionally need to be considered in a given standard so in the bottom left part of the slide you'll see that I've, I've defined or I got a, a, a visual graphic of uh, creepage and clearance. Creepage being distance between two surfaces uh, or between two bodies but along a surface. Clearance being that same distance on a similar body but it's only dealing with uh, distance between air. And so that's the result of all the other inputs that we uh, collect from the customer as a result of what's contained in the standard itself. So to that we need to know the specific standards that need to be met. Whether it's one or multiple standards, be it across you know, IEC or UL or, or VDE, TUV, whatever global standard uh, criteria it is, that's something that we need to know. And then also the level of insulation that you require within that standard, whether it be functional insulation, which means the transformer just needs to operate electrically uh, in the circuit, to a reinforced standard, which is uh, three layers of protection uh, from the user for electric shock. Uh, incorporating that, there might be other operating conditions that you uh, request or require for the transformer operation itself. Does it need to operate above sea level at a, to a certain degree, uh, the pollution degree? What's the dirtiness of the environment that the transformer needs to operate in? And then any other specific test requirements uh, that you have for, for testing, uh, reliability, or longevity of the transformer, uh, life testing, uh, those types of things, um, all like to be collected in the process of designing a transformer. So, uh, methodology then to meet these safety distances uh, within a standard itself. Uh, the first one is physical distance. Safety can be referenced to either the primary or the secondary side of the transformer, or both. And so that leads to physical appearances of transformers being, you know, I guess a little bit uniform, for lack of a better word, uh, on the upper left uh, extreme of the slide, where you've got equal distance, uh, the red lines depicting, you know, distance from the middle of the transformer to the pins equally on either side of the core and coil assembly, versus something that would have a standard reference to one side, and then you would have extended uh, bobbins on uh, a rail on one side of the transformer or the other. All of these are, are incorporated and designed to optimally meet your particular standard requirements. Then in lieu of distance, there are uh, an, what are called annex exceptions. Uh, this deals with different formulations or different insulations uh, on a specific thing to meet distance in lieu of spacing. Uh, triple insulated wire is a good example. Uh, its criteria is to have three separate or an extruded layers of insulation on a wire to meet that particular creepage and clearance distance in lieu of actually having the physical distance. So it meets the requirements regardless. Same thing goes for tape. Uh, layers of tape on windings can be used to, to meet uh, these creepage and clearance uh, distances in lieu of spacing. Um, and it, again, that's an incorporation of the total coil design. Last thing then is, is seal joints, encapsulations. Um, things along this lines are, are potting and over molding, transfer moldings. Different techniques used uh, within the transformer ultimately to, uh, instead of making the transformer larger, can be used in lieu of that distance uh, because creepage and clearance would physically make the transformer larger. Um, without the without the seal joints and these annex exceptions. Um, last thing to note is some of the things you might see that might not be totally attributed to the transformer to meet a total safety solution might be something like a, a PC board with with air gaps or or dams put in between components um, that you might see. And all that is, again, a, a, a measure of meeting creepage and clearance distances in a different way. Uh, that isn't necessarily just on the transformer itself. 
So an overview of voltage testing for transformers. Dialectric testing is probably one of, one of the most popular uh, terms uh, that's used. Um, it's a constant high voltage waveform. Uh, test the transformer and all the insulating materials and properties at once and senses how much leakage current there is uh, from the transformer. If it's over the level, it's a fail. Impulse testing then is a little bit different. It is a high energy surge, um, which is more along the lines of a survival type test. So a high energy pulse is introduced to the transformer to see what happens. Really, if the component still works, it's a pass uh, with regards to the testing. Versus partial discharge, uh, which is a lower voltage lower voltage step uh, with high frequency pulses and it uh, cinches discharges uh, kind of within winding material or really along finding holes and voids along a surface um, and it once it finds a discharge level it, it's uh, depicted really with the graphic that's the blue lines is the the discharge levels if they're uh, over a minimum criteria that's also a fail Topology for isolated drivers. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, push, pull, and flyback because that's what I'll be referring to for uh, solutions later on. But really for a push, pull to topology, it's uh, BH utilization of a particular core material. And that's depicted in the, the red part of the graphs uh, in the slide. The blue then is the operational parts or the designed uh, portions of how that transformer will operate within those material parameters. So you'll see that a, a push-pull then utilizes uh, a little bit more of the BH curve, and we call that a two-quadrant operation, versus a flyback type topology, which is a single-quadrant operation. And then in the middle, you'll just see some you know, observations for you know, pluses and minuses for uh, design and implementation, not necessarily put in for you know, good and bad, um, even though I have pluses and minuses in there. Um, uh, it's really more to be more of a steering to say when you're choosing a topology for a particular application that you need, what type of IC chip am I going to choose to do that? Here again on this same slide, it's really a light comparison in a matrix table um, for uh, flyback and, and push-pull operation. Uh, and uh, we'll be sending this presentation out uh, after we get done, but it basically uh, boils down again to a selection criteria of, of how you want to implement your particular application based on topology. So moving back to a push-pull driver, uh, you can see here the general schematic and, and layout of a complete circuit operation. Um, and I wanted to highlight kind of the switching cycles of the push-pull converter because it can operate in both an unregulated and a regulated operation depending on how the output is treated. And so the switching cycles on a push-pull, um, when one switch fed is on, it energizes one half of a primary winding. Uh, that energy is then transferred out to the secondary. And then correspondingly, when the other switch is on and the other is off, the other half of the primary winding is energized, giving up its energy and transferred to the secondary for operation. So you can see here that depiction, uh, at circle A and circle B, of that, that uh, switching back and forth of the push-pull operation of a voltage waveform to circle C which is the output uh, and the highlight for this is uh, really an un unregulated driver operation uh, which is a mode uh, for this particular topology. Now to switch that to a regulated output to a classic you know DC voltage out uh, it's just the addition of a LDO or an output inductor applied to the secondary uh, after the transformer. Flyback topology then is a little bit different because the instead of an energy transfer topology, it's an energy storage topology. The implication there is that the core needs to be able to so store a given amount of energy during a, a cycle or a period and to be able to do that to keep the size of the core small due to this, this current or energy storage capability the core needs to be physically gapped in some way, shape, or form along the, the path of, of, or the flux path. And so this idea of, of gapping increases the energy storage of the device, but at the same time, it actually drops the uh, incremental or it drops the permeability of the material itself 
to either an incremental state, the, the graph that you see on the right, um, which is ends up being an effective permeability plot versus field strength. Likening that out, it can be extrapolated to an inductance versus current. So you can start to see that as you gap, which is green to purple, the gap gets larger, permeability drops. In order to maintain a level of inductance over a given amount of current, more turns of wire need to be added onto the coil of the transformer to maintain that given amount of initial magnetizing inductance that's needed. And so it's those trade-offs back and forth that, that dictate, um, again, you know, sizing and, and what the, the shape and, and form of the transformer is going to be. So moving on now to Born's power conversion solutions and some examples that we have for, for BMS systems uh, is our ACT line and low power isolated flyback solutions as far as the transformer goes. Uh, and then uh, current sense resistors that we have, you know, both standard catalog and, and custom solutions for. Uh, to begin with, though, our, our newest, uh, one of our newest releases uh, for transformers is our HCT uh, transformer line, specifically for use in the TI SN6501 uh, type chipsets. Um, the transformer designed to be extremely low profile and, and small footprint. Uh, with still maintaining a large amount of creepage and clearance distance to comply with most reinforced uh, UL and IEC standards. Uh, another highlight is it's a reinforced insulation for a working voltage of 800 volts AC, uh, which is quite high, uh, with an extended temperature range of minus 40 to plus 125, and then still meeting all the criteria for, for chipsets as far as input-output voltage uh, and current handling. So what's the advantage to the HCT line as far as meeting high creepage and clearance distances? What's well, in the construction of the, the toroid header and how the wires are routed around the header itself? And so we begin with you know, primary insulated, triple insulated wire and FIW wire for the secondary. And uh, isolation then is, is referenced to the secondary side of the transformer. So then distance really only needs to be concentrated to one side of the header. Uh, thus, you can see uh, from, the, from the slide, the primary pins on the right uh, really would be zero or, or very little distance when the bulk of the eight millimeters of creepage and clearance then would be only to the secondary pins. So the routing then of the wire on the outside of the header would uh, contemplate or incorporate that creepage and clearance distance uh, from the center of the assembly to the pins. Then for the inside assembly from the, the windings to core, that's the triple insulated wire. Then the uh, last thing to consider is the, the core to pin distance. Uh, that's what's incorporated now with the uh, advanced header design, which is a, uh, a base of the module and then a cap is pressed in on top of that. Well, the pressing in is, is what gives it that extended creepage uh, distance, as you can see depicted by the red lines in this slide. Uh, so then uh, distance itself is measured because that's a longer distance than from the primary to secondary pins itself. The purple line de depicts the actual item of interest is where do you measure or the shortest distance that needs to qualify for creepage and clearance. Uh, so as you can see is uh, because of the inherent design, eight millimeters is the criteria today. To meet something larger than that, simply uh, scaling of the distance between primary and secondary pins uh, would be required up to the limits of the creepage and clearance distance of the uh, core to the outside of the pin. So the series and benefit competitive uh, advantage is, is this matrix uh, simply put together and is more of highlights as compared to our competitors. Uh, the best of which we could see is, is a working voltage for uh, reinforced to 800 volts uh, and also the availability of uh, a large number of different turns ratios for the transformers themselves. Um, uh, we've also got customized avail or customization options available, uh, but we're trying to release uh, more turns ratios for better selection uh, on the catalog for our website. Comparing push-pull then to uh, footprint size, 
the small portion of a push-pull driver uh, versus the uh, construction of, say, a, a flyback type transformer. You now get into the realm of flyback transformers hinging on uh, necessarily being uh, made larger without an excessive amount of you know customization and, and tooling for a different type of header similar to the HCT series. And so really uh, flybacks will, will in this case maybe tend to be a little bit larger for a, a given input and output. Um, but I springboard that as to say Again, it, it doesn't matter for topology and, and usage of the transformer, it's what you're after. So on the flip side of that, we have uh, flyback transformer solutions uh, covering pretty much any flyback uh, processor that's out there. Of interest right now are the, the smaller, uh, isolated, low power flyback applications, which are connotated by uh, you know different wordings. TI uses their flyback connotation. Maxim has an isobuck. Uh, analog devices is a, is a micro power. These are all variations of a, of a flyback type topology um, incorporating uh, as small as possible transformer designs. So let's not forget the signal level. Um, we've got uh, interface solutions for that level of transformer need as well. Uh, the highlight here is the SM91501 uh, for SPI type and ISO SPI interfaces. Uh, it incorporates both the transformer and the common mode choke to meet not only the safety standard requirements but also the signal translation uh, requirements to transmit signal back and forth. Uh, as a update, uh, the SM91501 and 509 are both fully uh, UL approved, uh, which means the transformer itself is approved to meet you know high working voltages. Uh, and creepage at least eight millimeters uh, of distance uh, and all of the SM or both lines of SMs that are uh, put here are both automotive grade so they're AECQ 200 qualified and capable. Moving on to shunt resistive solutions uh, Borns basically has two styles we have catalog and customized uh, shunts that can be designed uh, so optimizing these designs for different resistive applications uh, really is, is in choosing or the, the, the devil is in as much detail in the data sheets as possible. Whether it's choosing the best ohmic value between you know, resolution and power loss, uh, absolute power ratings, uh, surge current, and any type of temperature derating de that's, that's needed in the design is very well categorized in, in our data sheets temperature compensation uh, graphs, and then uh, differential material thermal EMF is, is also in there as well. So our standard shunt offering is there, but then also the customization capability based even on the catalog design is, you know, we offer you know, complete stamping and, and capability for different shapes and incorporations for different uh, even modules if the need arises. So in summary, uh, you know, magnetics design involves multiple design trade-offs, and you know the trade-offs affect the size and the performance and, and and noise floor of the transformer itself, of which safety and isolation play a large part of the design process uh, in a BMS system. And automotive requirements uh, add another layer of requirement for the same thing. And separation between low and high voltage uh, can be implemented several ways, but typically it's by the transformer. And again, we've got a multitude of solutions to meet these performance and safety requirements, uh, whether it be at the power conversion level for HCT series, the signal isolation level with our SM type series or, or module transformers, uh, and then to say that there's custom and actually catalog options available to meet uh, challenging uh, safety requirements for both uh, shunt resistors um, but any other specialized selection of any catalog and, and custom applications that you might have. And with that, uh, I will bid you adieu, and I am going to refer back to Paul to uh, talk about uh, overcurrent and overvoltage protection. Thank you, Kyle. You have all just heard a lot about DC to DC converters and power. 
but battery management systems include more than just power. There's also a variety of support circuitry, such as communication links and monitoring and sensing circuits. And because these are low-level circuits, they're going to need protection from overvoltage and overcurrent events. And I've listed a few events here that can cause these kind of hazards. They mostly involve times when something changes, like a load may change, or conductors touch each other that aren't supposed to touch. People have studied these kinds of events for a long time, and they've summarized their findings in recommendations such as these. Often your customer will require you to satisfy these, but if they don't, you should still consider them in your designs. So the first communication line I'm going to talk about is CAN bus. It's very common in BMS. You'll find it all over the place, and you'll pretty much always find TVS protection because it's popular and because it's effective and uh, relatively inexpensive. Borns makes a couple devices. We have one for 12-volt battery systems, and we have one for 24-volt battery systems. Now, that's somewhat unusual. You won't find those just anywhere. So uh, we do have those available for you if you're working in a 24-volt system. Now, you'll also need a choke for EMI filtering for successful design. And BM, uh, Bowens makes several of those. You see the new one there, the SRF3225 at the bottom. It's a nice small part. And here's a graph of the, how effective the TVS protection is. On the left, I show a standard IEC 500 volt test feeding the differential lines of the CAN bus through two 80 ohm resistors. So for equivalent resistance of about 40 ohms and uh, 500 volts of voltage, you would expect about 12 amps or so going into the system. On the right hand side, you'll see the waveforms. The green is the current and you see a peak there at 11 amps, so it's very close to what we'd expect. And you'll see the blue clamping levels there, 36.4 volts. So instead of 500 volts impinging on your system, now you only have 36.4 volts impinging on your system. So that just shows you how effective this, these TVS diodes are in providing the uh, protection. There's one area here that you may not think of needing over voltage protection, and that's the battery rails on your all your power packs, your high voltage rails. Because the currents are high and the voltage is high, when you disconnect these a pack, you can get these huge inductive kickbacks, and the voltages can be large enough to actually destroy your contactor switches. So to protect them, you put a TVS diode across them. Now these aren't your normal TVSs; these are PTVSs, power TVSs. There's, they're designed specifically for high power applications. The PTVS3 I show here says that these will handle 3KA and I've got two 430 volt devices in series. So I expect this battery rail to be operating around the 800 volts or so. And you can string as many of these together in series as you need to reach the levels that you're operating your battery rails at. Now I also show here a soft switch. This is a software controlled switch, 48 volt switch, using a bunch of parallel MOSFETs. And it's going to have the same problem that the mechanical switch has. When you open it, you're going to get an inductive kickback and it is also going to need TVS protection. So again I show a PTVS3, but here I show a 66 volt part. I chose that because it's high enough that it won't engage when the 48 volts is at the high end of his tolerance, or maybe this switch is tested in a, at 60 volts. But you can't get that clamping voltage too high, or it won't provide protection for the breakdown voltage on the MOSFETs. So the 66 volt part seems to hit the sweet spot for 48 volt switches. Low dump is another high voltage transient caused by alternator coils collapsing and the energy is then injected into lightly loaded systems. And you may be thinking, I don't have an alternator. I don't need to worry about low dump. I'm working on electric vehicles or industrial BMS. But you're still going to have long transients. And by long, I'm talking about half a second or so versus traditional short surge type transients, which are 1 to 10 microseconds. And you can get these long transients from load changes or hazards. There is a standard written for load dump. So even though you don't have an official load dump situation, it's still a good idea to use that standard in your designs. It's convenient, your customers are familiar with it, it's out there. 
There's a lot of history behind it, and you can buy search generators that implement this. So until something else is written, I would recommend still getting a copy of this and using it. And here's the waveform that it discusses, and it allows the customer to pick different values, uh, the highest, the peak voltage there, the intrinsic impedance of the generator. I show a typical test diagram on the right, and that's the resistance we're talking about. You can also pick the pulse width, you know, narrow pulse, big pulse. And as you might expect, the worst case condition occurs when the voltage is big, when the resistance is small, so we're dumping a bunch of current in there, and when the pulse width is long. Borns makes two diodes specifically designed to handle the huge energies in a low dump transient. This is the bigger one. The dotted line shows the XY of the uh, biggest dimensions of the package, and you can see the solder pads there. And uh, here's the smaller one. You can see the dotted line. It's a little bit smaller. The solder pads um, are, are a little bit less, but the big change is the width, or excuse me, the height of the part. It's uh, less than one third the height of the bigger part. So it's thin enough that you might be able to put it on the bottom side of your PC board. Here's the performance you can see for the flat part. 12 volt systems on the left, 24 volt systems on the right. And if you remember, I said the worst case condition occurs when the voltage is high, so that's the right edge of the graph. When the resistance is low, that now you're talking about the upper right corner, and when the pulse width is long. And you can see on these graphs, as the pulse gets longer, we get further and further away from that upper right corner. Now I'm also gonna embed here the uh, bigger part in blue. And you can see for 400 milliseconds, the blue part really hugs that upper right corner a lot better than the flat part does. It'll handle higher transients. And that's the trade-off you make with between the flat package and the bigger package. The bigger package can handle more energy in the pulse. You'll see the titles of these graphs, ISO 7637-2. That's the old low dump standard. We also have data for the new low dump standard. Now here's a comparison with a common competitor that's out in the field. You all probably know who this is. And again, the best performing part will get close to that upper right corner and you'll see Borns outperforms uh, the competitor. In fact, uh, Borns will handle half ohm of resistance almost throughout the entire voltage range, whereas the competitor's at one ohm. So we can handle twice the current, which is four times the energy uh, compared to the competitor part. The, these new Borns low dump diodes are really nice parts. You should really uh, take a look at those. Here's a quick comparison of the two. Um, the one to the fourth row, talks about the voltage, available voltage ranges, and you see the, the bigger part has a little wider range than the thinner part does. The temperatures go up to 175. You can see the compliance standards that we meet on the bottom. These are nice automotive quality parts. There's another communications link that's becoming more popular with battery management systems, and that is Ethernet. And here I show a schematic on the right. You see a weak phi on the left, and the Ethernet signal goes off on the right where it's exposed to hazards. The hazard comes, hits the twisted pair, and it shows up on both sides of the legs of the transformer. They go up, the center tap goes up, engaging the clamping devices. And I show a TBS or an MOV there. Since it's common mode, it doesn't make it across the transformer to the other side unless the transformer breaks down. And that's one of the purposes of using a clamping device there at the center tap. However, Ethernet is not perfectly balanced. There's impedance mismatches you are going to get a differential mode and that does make it across the transformer and that's when the TBU and the TBS come into play. Now a TBU is a MOSFET switch with a controller built into it. You can think of it as a resettable fuse and you can see a dash 100 in the part number. This device trips at 100 milliamps and then also show a TBS there which provides a fast lower level precision clamping to the phi. So this phi is protected with both over voltage and over current. This TBU, uh, you see a dash DT in the uh, part number. DT is a series that has relatively low on resistance. And I picked that so that it doesn't attenuate the ethernet signal as much. It doesn't affect the reach as much. But in a battery management system, 
it, they're somewhat confined, so you probably don't care about 100 meter lengths. So you may not care about the reduction in reach. So you could probably pick other TBU devices than the DT. You know, pick one that matches your requirements. Now I show here a maxed out, super protected phi. And depending upon how weak your phi is, or how bad the hazard is, or how important warranty issues are for you, you may not need all of this. I would start with the clamping devices on the center tap. Since most of the energy is common mode, that's the device that'll take the brunt of the, uh, of the energy. If that tests out to not be enough, then you can add the TBU and the other TBS on the, last, on, on the left. So in summary, I have shown you some examples of some over voltage and over current events, as well as a list of some standards documents that you should consider in your designs. Then I showed you some over voltage protection ideas, TVS diodes for CAN bus, power TVS for contactor switches. I discussed some issues with load dump and why you might need that even without an alternator. Then I showed you some examples of ethernet link protection. So thank you very much for listening. And I believe now we are open for questions.